Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm pretty excited about this, uh, the, the, the webinar that we're presenting tonight because I think that um, what, what we've got now is the opportunity for South Pacific to really stand at the, the probably the forefront of um, uh, dealing with developmental stress, complex, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. We're still reaching around to describe um, these symptoms, but yet if, if you have them, if you've got, uh, if, if you experience what I'm about to talk about tonight, then it is a, a completely debilitating uh, experience, uh, and it, it it can be best summed up with our model here at South South Pacific. So I I want to talk about uh, what's what's coming through now that these symptoms are being uh, I suppose looked at in a, in a different light. And uh, I always thought South Pacific and, and and the program that Bill and Lorraine brought over from the Meadows. Um, which is Pia Melody's uh, uh, model and, and, and wanted to bring to it so sort of generously to Australia is, is it allowed people to go in, in depth um, to, uh, to deal with the, not just that secondary symptom that was traditionally looked at. Um, now, I'm just, folks, I'm just going to do a few things here. I'll, I'll, you'll see me tonight struggling as I, I'll just mute people. So it's just a... If anyone's got their mic open, if you can keep your end muted. I don't know how that works for phones, but uh, we'll do our best. So when, when this model was, was developed, it was developed by Pia Melody, and it was very experiential in nature. And she write, reminds me very much of um, that Dr. Alan Shaw, whose work at the moment about affect regulation and early childhood, the first 1,000 days of life, um, and the impact that trauma has there is what Pia Melody was trying to describe in the model when she talked about uh, the wounded child. And, um, and so what, what, what I'll, I'll, I'll move on to is just, um, I think what Pia brought to the table was, was that we've got to become aware. And when, what we uh, learnt is survival skills, not thriving skills, when we had early childhood trauma. And, and I've always loved this statement of, of uh, uh, Carl Jung's, the until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. As we, I, I've heard so many people in 12-step meetings say, oh, I've got that, you don't understand, I've got that addictive personality. i just got to find some phrase that sums up this thing that I am. And, and yet when you get down to it and you start to look at what those primary symptoms are, are as a result of uh, developmental trauma, then all of a sudden the big picture comes to light. And it's not that I was an organism predestined to be this. Genetics have some factor, but that environmental impact is what uh, derails us and certainly sends us fatefully down a path until we get conscious, until we can uh, sort of turn it around. And that consciousness, uh, the, you know, the saying, the examined life is, is, is no picnic. It, it, at Pia Melody and Breaking Free, one of the resources I'll talk about tonight, outlines that the first sort of year to two years in recovery is awful because as you start to become aware of and, and become conscious of who we are, then it can be really disorientating. And as she says in the introduction to Breaking Free, that it actually feels more normal to be in the disease than it does to be in the illness. So if we... If we Move into that, that model, I, I, I will be doing a webinar on the model, so I'm excited about that uh, um, in the next couple of months. I'm not sure if it's the next one, but our, our website will tell you. But essentially, the, the bottom of this model tells you the story, and that's all I'll read and we'll move on into this presentation. And it's, it says that children need healthy parenting to develop and maintain attitudes and beliefs. And that doesn't really sum up what we're talking about here because it's, it's, it's one sentence won't sum up even around self-esteem. The, 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 uh, the soul murder, as Bradshaw calls it, when a little person doesn't get the basic needs met and the shame that it then carries. And for the folks that have had their, uh, got these complex post-traumatic stress symptoms, uh, it, it means that, that a whole other part of our brain activates in and of itself without our ability, uh, without skills to become aware and stop it. So it can be incredibly disorientating. So, so learning to have boundaries, learning to be in our body, uh, in our thoughts and our feelings with awareness can be something that we simply don't get if we don't get that healthy parenting and that healthy environment. And, and so when there's a childhood lack of nurturing, trauma, abuse, neglect, it'll, it can cause a developmental immaturity. 
And what, what uh, essentially that gets played out as is that we develop survival skills. So we learn to survive and, and, but, but not thrive. And so in that, that not thriving, uh, we'll start to see uh, the wounded child reflected in that f how we felt during problematic uh, childhood experiences. Now, when Pio put this together, it was out without the benefits of neuroscience, and, and it, but, but it was with the benefit of working with traumatised people, including herself. So she, she, her story is quite a public story. It's in the beginning of Facing Codependence, and she highlights her own struggles around developmental trauma, first tackled as alcoholism for herself and then having to uh, then look at the underlying impact of the trauma. When she started to develop this model at, at the meadow, she just got people who identified as having trauma to talk to her. Now, we know now that that's a small percentage of traumatised people. Because, because trauma is shame-based, and shame-based trauma means we don't talk about it. So you can ask someone that's been traumatised, have they experienced trauma, and it's likely if you ask them that directly that they, they won't be able to answer you. And Bessel van der Kolk points this out when he, he talks in his presentations about the history of the DSM a di a diagnostic manual and how uh, when we used to ask trauma in a very blunt, uh, direct way, that the statistics were awfully inadequate uh, and he mentions around childhood sexual assault that they thought at one point that only one uh, in a hundred thousand women were affected and uh, and that, they, they, that there was varying arguments about the impact of that effect uh, and yet we know that when you ask about that sort of trauma now in a completely different way uh, that, that that statistic is, is outrageously um, misleading. So, so this felt sense, the other thing that we want to talk about tonight is what we do know now about neuroscience and how when Alan Shaw started writing about this, he was speculating, but with the, the neuroscience that we have and the, this burgeoning school of thought from the interpersonal neurobiologists that we've got uh, uh, more information now about the triune brain. I'll talk tonight a little bit about the polyvagal theory, the work of Dr. Ed Tronick, where we, where we can see now what literally happens neurobiologically to us that changes our physiology, that, that impacts the way that we experience ourselves at a level that, that insight, that CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, uh, can only make a very small inroad, and yet it's a really good complementary therapy if we do that body-focused work that we now know we need to do. So, so the, the wounded child, when Peter started to say that that was felt in the body, felt sense, in the feeling states, then those, those, that was way ahead of its time when she was looking for that. When she developed the survivors program and going in and getting people into their body uh, through guided visualizations and meditations, that that somatic experiencing herself unlocks those feelings. And I remember when I first came here, I had the uh, benefit of working with Wes Taylor, who had been taught by Peer around the, uh, this uh, model and doing the survivor's program, as it was then called. And it just I, I saw in front of my own eyes how people uh, were able to get into their body and then into their feeling states around things that they had not remembered for a long time. Or if they'd remembered it, they were very disconnected from it. So this felt sense when Pia wrote about that was, was this what we would now say is an implicit memory, a memory that comes up from, from the brain, the part of the brain that doesn't store calendar dates and times and therefore is rarely impacted positively by insight in recovery. So the feeling comes up, we can, we're not even really in control of our reality at that time, but, the, but getting in touch with that felt sense is, is really important and we'll look at the, the end of this presentation on, on the different ways now of getting in touch with uh, how the brain has been impacted and, and how that triune brain uh, working from the bottom of the brain up and the top of the brain down can just change the face of therapy. Now the AAC is really important I think this is where CBT comes in handy uh, and certainly in our model, our reparenting uh, uh, tool in our model is is the adapted self reflects the ways we were parented at problematic times. So what we're looking for then is the defense mechanisms and the core beliefs that that generational uh, uh, belief system that can happen in a family. And, and so we might end up with the same, uh, I'll talk a bit later on about how family roles, genetics and just sibling order can, can change uh, uh, one sibling's experience of a family system to another's. Uh, but, but essentially we'll all develop an AAC. 
that, that will be around our self-esteem and boundaries and reality and, de and dependency issues, uh, uh, trying to distance ourselves from the original pain. And, and, and Pete Walker makes the, is, is a psychotherapist from San Francisco. I'll mention a book of his as we go along. Um, it, uh, it, it, his book on this issue I think is very complementary to Pia's work and he just makes the point that, that the AAC, the, 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 our defence mechanisms, the, the survival techniques we've got are just about running away from that soul murder, as Bradshaw put it, where we have a toxic shame core. That, that, that toxic shame to a little person equals death, that we just can't survive without parents, without uh, the, the, the stability in a family home. And if there's no stability, we've got to go into fantasy to create it, or at least into disassociation to escape it. So, so depending on the sort of trauma will be depending on what, what shape your AAC takes. And that, that will then tell you what tools you need to develop in your functional adult as we move along. Now, of course, the, if anyone's been at South Pacific, you've heard me say this sentence a thousand times, untreated primary symptoms lead to secondary symptoms. The result of that, so those two things, untreated. So we're talking about untreated, self-esteem, boundary, uh, reality, dependency issues, then being played out in our adult life as mental health, addiction, lead to crisis, unmanageability and intimacy issues. So in other words, our life is derailed. At best, we'll be medicating. At worst, we'll be, uh, we'll be simply um, surviving. And uh, I mean, uh, I do make fun of that statement, a broken clock can be right at least twice a day. So we get it right. Uh, there was a recent study from Harvard that talked about the impact of developmental trauma and the way that it impacts the brain. That AAC could be a very high functioning person when it comes to school or work, but, but in interpersonal relational uh, settings, it, we can be completely derailed whenever we perceive a threat. So, so uh, you know, some of us come in here really high functioning as human beings and uh, uh, and, and can be quite confused when we start to tackle some of these issues. So, so the way out of this is treatment, recovery, intimacy and reparenting and it develops a functional adult and that's what I want to go into in regards to complex post-traumatic stress because uh, even the way that we talk about reality uh, here at South Pacific needs to be adjusted if we've got complex post-traumatic stress uh, symptoms because this, that CBT helpful tool can be uh, not useful if we're in a flashback, if we're in a, uh, an experience of um, uh, overwhelm at a, limbic, at a limbic level, then the insight and all those tools of recovery for a while are, are temporarily offline. So the main symptoms, to just give you a sense, because I was in a group today running a PTSD group and, and there was a question of, look, well, I don't know about this PTSD thing. How would I know I've got it? So alterations to, to in, in, in regulation and effective impulses. So in other words, that limbic system will fire and, and we will take a bazooka to a knife fight. We will overreact or underreact. So we will, uh, we will not be able to have, as uh, Stephen Porges says, that, that use our upper vagal system to, to put the handbrake on and regulate at the, the bottom of the, from the top of the brain down. We'll really struggle with that. There'll be alterations in attention and consciousness. Now, for folks that have had developmental trauma that leads to uh, uh, dis disassociation and personality disorders, then we can lose time and space. Uh, and for others, uh, in regards to attention, and we talked about it in group today, we can just simply get quite confused. And so we, when we lose our executive functioning, all of a sudden, uh, uh, where we might have been high functioning, now making a decision on what we want for lunch can be overwhelming. Alterations uh, in, in self-perception, so how we experience ourselves, can be really different. And again, depending on the sort of trauma, some people are really disconnected from their physical body and that's how they end up with physical illness. They, we, we're, not, we're not connected with pain and suffering, uh, discomfort, um, our thought perceptions, our feelings. Um, anyone that's been through South Pacific has been harassed by us all for feeling checks, trying to tune us into what's happening in our body. So there's those alterations. Alterations in perception of the perpetrator. Now this can go right up to where we actually um, can have the Stockholm syndrome, uh, and 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 will have quite a can have even affection towards perpetrators. We can, uh, through as Pia Melody says, adult defence mechanisms of minimisation, denial, delusion, and memory loss, uh, 
continue relationships with perpetrators and see them in a completely different light, especially if we get to delusion, which is that disassociative uh, personality type. Alterations in relationships with self, so we really struggle, uh, sorry, relationships with others, so any interpersonal, as Pia says, in, in regards to uh, our dependency needs, that we simply don't do interdependency well. We're either anti-dependent or too dependent. Assomatization and or medical problems, so we can have a hypochondri, we can have hypochondriac sort of responses to things or we can be completely disconnected, but we eventually when you live that way there'll be medical problems and alterations in systems of meaning. Now for anyone that's been through South Pacific, uh, one of the tools we have is sharing realities and when we share realities we invite people to get curious about what do you make up about you. So, so anyone that's been through here and has uh, looked at those meetings we give ourselves as a response to experiencing something uh, unsettling from someone else, then you'll notice those core beliefs are very much about that we're projecting the, the beliefs we got from our original in, in injury onto the situation that we're having, which at times is really confusing to others because they, 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 they just asked to pass the salt or they just said they can't pick you up on time or they forgot the milk. But, but, but the system of meaning we might project onto that can be radically different and, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that as we go on. Pete Walker in his book, uh, uh, Complex Post-Traumatic Stress from, Thriving to, from Surviving to Thriving, says that, that, that the key developmental arrests, so these are the things that get arrested once we get this developmental trauma. Uh, Self-acceptance is arrested. A clear, a clear sense of identity, really knowing our body, thoughts, feelings and behaviour, as Pia says, feeling quite centred in that. Uh, we, we, we have arrested self-compassion, arrested self-protection. Uh, have a poor capacity to draw comfort from relationship. And, and for some folks, that, uh, that, that w when we've had this developmental trauma, uh, relationships are just an overwhelming trigger uh, right up into and including uh, Pete Walker was saying if, if at some times even getting a therapist can be difficult and we end up picking therapists that continue to re-traumatise us and he makes the, uh, the point that for some of us it's getting a pet or an animal that will give us unconditional love that starts to restore a sense of connection. So it's not, it's not to sort of say that we can't get well, but I just I think what I love about Pete's work is he, he simply says that this will be difficult. That's what I like about peer melodies. There's a solution, but it's not going to be easy sometimes. And I think that's important to know when you're trying to deal with this, because otherwise, uh, I know for myself, you can go into hopelessness. A poor ability to relax. Pete Walker talks about this idea of uh, people with post-traumatic stress find it difficult to go into neutral, to just be. Uh, he, he quotes John Bradshaw who talks about um, the, the, the development of codependency as we become human doings, not human beings, uh, as a result of this uh, low self-esteem, this lack of inherent worth. Uh, we have an arrest in the capacity for full self-expression. Uh, we can really struggle with willpower and motivation. We can either be crazily uh, willful or, or uh, that self-will run right they talk about in 12-step fellowships or we can really lack it and swing between the two. Um, uh, peace of mind, having some sort of serenity within can be just really difficult. People are, especially with anxiety and depression, are vibrating at, at, at a level where peace seems to be uh, something they'll never achieve. Uh, poor self-care around our body, thoughts, feelings and behaviours. Um, real difficulty in believing that life is a gift and uh, the Dr. Shobe, Professor Shobe from Harvard University talked about that in a presentation that I looked up on uh, mindfulness and self-esteem and he made the point that somebody that's grown up receiving that nurturing parenting uh, basically doesn't get up in the morning and feel wonderful about themselves but they get up with a sense that life's going to work out for them. They've got that peace of mind, they've got that ability to relax into themselves and know that they've got the, the skills and abilities to be able to uh, uh, move on through the day knowing that even if they come up against uh, trials and tribulations, they've got what it takes inside to, to, to cope and, and, and make better decisions. Uh, the self-esteem, which is P Pia says certainly in her model is the, the symptom we see the most, that it's the most defining symptom is that 
that inappropriate levels of self-esteem, so feeling either one down less than or one up better than others and a, and a lack in self-confidence. So I just wanted to put this snapshot up. Uh, again, anyone that's ever seen me in a room and if I get near a whiteboard, uh, I wish I could just press a button and this comes up every time. Now Pia says that around our reality, uh, when she was developing this model, she stood in front of a mirror and said, well, who am I? And came up with I'm my physical body and all the, you know, and, and all that entails, as Dan Siegel says, the embodied brain, the central nervous system and, and uh, everything about ourselves that makes us, uh, makes us as humans. Uh, our consciousness, our mind, uh, our feeling states and our behaviours. Now, traditionally, as we would certainly say, and, and uh, I've, I'll badly paraphrase the, the work of William James where he talked to raise the idea is, you know, do we run because we're afraid or are we afraid because we're running? What kicks in first? Now, now, I think with people that grew up fairly functioning, are able to manage themselves from the top of the brain down, meaning that they can put on that vagal handbrake around perceived threat if it's not a threat can certainly take interventions from outside through their five senses, experience the sort of somatic visceral uh, uh, information and data that comes up from the body. If it's not a perceived threat, we go in from our history, all learnt, learning and experiences and core beliefs and give it a meaning. That meaning defines the feeling and then we choose what to do with it. Now, now the interesting thing with post-traumatic stress is it all gets derailed at the brain, at the at that that moment that we have determined it's a threat. Now, if you've gone, if you've got post-traumatic stress disorder from a life-threatening single event in your life, then it might be that 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 a certain smell or a certain sound might trigger that that visceral response. For post complex post-traumatic stress that came from less than nurturing to abusive parenting. Then, then we've got a relational trigger. So if you grew up around domestic violence or, uh, 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 or where it was an unsafe uh, uh, situation at home, then, then when someone comes in and they're red in the face and their eyes are sort of piercing, then that might be all it takes for somebody to, to, to go into that limbic reaction. Uh, if you uh, used to be struck with a hand, if someone used to backhand you and you're in New York and you're waiting to catch a cab and someone rushes up beside you and whacks their hand in the air, you could go into a reaction just like a veteran might go into a reaction on New Year's Eve when they hear a firework. So I want to talk a little bit about what happens in that. Uh, Peter Levine, uh, who is uh, uh, through somatic experiencing, uh, uh, the unspoken voice, uh, this quote from Waking the Tiger says that, that when we experience post-traumatic stress, so traumatic symptoms are not caused by the triggering event. So as adults, these symptoms aren't caused by that. They stem from the frozen residue of, of energy that has not been resolved or discharged. And this residue remains trapped in the nervous system where it can wreak havoc on our bodies and on our spirits. So, so what, we, what happens is not so much this thing comes from outside of us, it happens to us. If you've grown up in a family system where you were blamed for how other, how other people felt, this is how it feels. Post-traumatic stress unconsciously feels as though, well, you're in front of me. I'm having this big response. It's about you. And if you'll change, I'll be better, which is the, the codependent part of this disease. So, so the idea uh, in, in treatment is that we've got to get this energy out of our body that our insight might not be able to access. So this is what we'll be looking at. So, so we know that, 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 that it gets derailed at the brain and as Pia says is in, in her functional adult is that we, uh, information is that we need to become aware. We've got to tune in to ourself. And so, so getting in touch somatically with the body uh, can be uh, triggering and painful but yet it can be a big part of the healing because that energy is stored in the body. And through feelings and through somatic work, we can sort of bring it up and discharge it. Then all of a sudden, we can have uh, the story or our narrative around our, our uh, history or we'll remember a traumatic event, but we don't have that stress uh, in our body anymore. And, and for anyone that's done any uh, of the treatments we're going to talk about tonight, sometimes the effect of it can be quite miraculous. Uh, uh, Dr. McLean uh, certainly put, put forward this idea of the triune brain, the development of evolution of the different parts of the, 
the, uh, the way that the brain works and how, how these different systems in the brain all work to keep us as high functioning human beings, uh, that, that, that if we've grown up in a very nurturing environment and, uh, and even if there was stress it was resolved and, and uh, if there was trauma there was repair. None of us grow up in a perfect system, so even if there is discomfort, it, as long as there's repair, it, we, we, we will be able to discharge that energy. So what, what, what this triune brain, brain uh, information did was open us up to looking at, well, what, how does the early childhood impact affect these systems? Dan Siegel came along and his work on the developing brain, uh, developing mind in, 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 in his Mindsight book and uh, is a real authority in, in, in with him and Alan Shaw now in the Interpersonal Neurobiologists uh, School of Thought, uh, comes up with this handy model of the brain. So I've put this slide here for people to be able to access later on when you look at the YouTube video and certainly look up his resources because this hand model of the brain is a great way to sort of understand uh, how he points out the knuckles on the top of the fingers coming over the top is that neocortex, the limbic system is the, the, the part that sits on top of the brain stem and the hand being the, the spinal cord and what he's basically saying is when we get triggered by perceived threat, we, we literally flip our lid and so we lose our executive functioning and start to function now from the part of the central nervous system that's there to save our life. Now, if we were, we were in the surf and saw a shark fin or in, the, in the, the forest and saw a bear or for us Aussies, a brown snake coming at you because they can be aggressive, we, we, we need that limbic system to get rid of, I've got to get milk, I've got an exam due, I've got to pick up the kids to just pump adrenaline through the body and run or, or uh, get some, the, 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 we might need to fight. So we need that adrenaline or cortisol to fight or flight and then the, the idea that if we can't, uh, there was a, 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 read a, a very powerful account of a man that was bushwalking, came across a brown bear, there was absolutely nothing he could do except freeze. And even though it came over and it caused him some injury, it lost interest in him. So, so just the idea that it's a great way if any of you guys have got kids that have trouble regulating to help explain the brain, so please look this up. So we know we know from this, 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 these three parts of the brain that if there's developmental trauma, Alan Shaw certainly points out that we, we have, it disorganises us throughout our lifespan. I'll get to his quote in a second. Stephen Paul just come along and, and certainly looked and, uh, and at this, these, this vagal system in the brain, this vagal system in the brain, and, and then gave us uh, some information that's been really crucial for, for us folks that have been working with trauma. Uh, his book, The Polyphagal Theory, is a, is a, 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 a fantastic resource um, and there's some fantastic things on YouTube that you can tune in and, and, and watch Stephen. So if any of this is uh, perks of interest, please do that. He just simply says that, that when we perceive threat, so if something's coming from outside the body or we perceive threat, this, our nervous system will, will react. Now our upper vagal system, our neocortex, our social engagement system when we're, when we're optimally functioning, will be able to rest and digest with our parasympathetic nervous system, we'll be able to socially engage, we'll have good eye contact, melodic tone, we'll, we'll, we'll be really present uh, with others and be present inside of ourselves. But if we perceive danger, we'll go into a hyperarousal, there's an increased heart rate, that sympathetic system takes flight, we'll mobilise and depending on the situation, we'll fight or flight. Uh, we can at this point have disassociated rage, those feats of enormous strength or, or terror and panic where, we, where, where we, if we can't fight it, we'll flight it. The other thing is that we're really in life threat where we think that there's nothing that we can do. And what's interesting about complex post-traumatic stress, sometimes we project this on the situations that, that aren't life threatening, but we've been triggered into life threat. And this is where we, we will go into high power arousal. We'll have a decreased heart rate, our parasympathetic dorsal vagal system activates and we will immobilize. Uh, and, and, and in the, the term freeze, and then disassociate and collapse. Now Peter Levine, when he talks about his somatic expression, shows a fantastic uh, resource in his uh, work around a, a, a fox 
carrying up a marsupial that's 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 dangling and, and being taken back to its den, but it's alive, but it's in freeze. The only thing left for it is to hope that the predator loses interest. So we have in our brain these these abilities to do this to save our life, but for uh, uh, human beings, we've got that this. Uh, a parasympathetic ventral vagal system that actually can handbrake that and if we've grown up in a fairly safe environment and we've learned to regulate we have access to that regulation when we haven't we can relationally be triggered into this other response so therefore that slide that I put up about uh, the reality it is we we get overridden if we get a trigger that, that triggers that that, that complex post-traumatic stress then, then our body activates that limbic system and we will go to that fight, flight and freeze response. Now you'll notice I've put fawn there and I've, I've taken that word from Pete Walker's book uh, and now even Dan Siegel when he talks about this now puts, puts faint down there uh, and, and, and in, a sense, in, in a sense that, that we're not freezing, we're not going into a, where our heart rate's dropped and we're literally uh, now not functioning hoping to survive if, if the predator loses interest. We've, we, we go into survival skills to the predator. And so in our case, it's generally another human being, so we will uh, trigger our codependency traits and, and, and we'll go into what he calls the four Fs later on as a way of explaining. But I suppose the take-home point from this slide is insight at this point when we're triggered doesn't work. We haven't got a connection to, to that neocortex information where that insight would be helpful. If it's implicit memory, if it's coming up and overwhelming us as a, as a feeling state, then we're not going to, we, we are now going to go into survival uh, mode and, and that can be really confusing to people around us, although it's very common for us to keep recreating generationally the trauma. So we might have grown up with domestic violence, we grew up with sexual trauma, and then here we are in our adult life, we've created a relationship where that's present. So sometimes the threat is in front of us because we've recreated it, but other times uh, it can be just a, 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 a trigger. I, I worked with a man once and, and uh, it, his mother, who was a highly traumatising and humiliating of, of his reality, leading to a, a, a post-traumatic stress, uh, the smell of Keen's curry powder was completely disorientating for him and it threw him into fight every time. And of course he picked a relational partner when he wasn't really conscious about this that every time she was unhappy uh, with him, of course curry was on the menu when he got home. And so that, that relational drama and how this plays out. So I'd probably be asking you guys out there to think about, well, what, yeah, what, is there any examples of that in your own life where you see uh, that, that, that simple trigger, just a fragrance, and all of a sudden we're into, uh, into that sort of reaction, and yet we go ahead and find someone that will play that other part in that relational trauma. So the reality issue is broken down, uh, and, and the, 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 the anxiety or depression or PTSD that it can create is that at that body level it's much more complex than we thought. The, the trium brain, the limbic reactivity, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And then, and then I always put in for folks that come into uh, treatment, uh, if they've got any addiction at all, there'll be an acute withdrawal syndrome that can take, uh, you know, anything from that first day up to 18 months, post-acute withdrawal syndrome and acute withdrawal syndrome, the way that the brain itself is going to uh, be reorganising itself just from the addiction. And then the physical illness and, and unwellness, there's a typo, I can just see our PR manager, uh, Jackie Grant, now just squirming in a seat. Um, so this, this, the physical side of this, which I want to talk about the biggest study they've ever done on, on adverse childhood experiences in a second, because it's, it's, it's not just the mental illness or the addictions that we see this. In our society, it's obesity, it's, uh, it's the heart problems, it's... It's the way that our body starts to break down, leading to and including early death. Uh, what we'll look at is, is also the way that once we grow up in an environment like this, the, the first thought wrong disease that they talk about with addiction, but it's the seat of obsession, obsession that we find in addiction, but also codependency, uh, the cognitive distortions, uh, defense mechanisms and core beliefs and the inner critic. The feeling state is very interesting at the South Pacific we talk about the the 
adult appropriate feelings, but then the toxic levels of feelings that can accumulate when we've got we've come from developmental trauma and then had adult life experience where we have very damaged boundaries and we, we go between those the primary symptom states of the wounded child and adult adapted child. Uh, that would now be experienced in that implicit memory. And one of the statements I like here, we, we come here trying to feel better, but in, in, in recovery generally we have to get better at feeling. It's uh, developmental trauma got us out of our body, out of our connection with our feeling states uh, and, and accumulated toxic feelings. We, we now need to get into that and, and release some of that, especially the shame. And then behaviourally what's hard in early recovery is everything I just mentioned for a while is really difficult to start to manage, so change is behavioural. And this is what uh, really uh, is difficult about early recovery, that, that if you're an alcoholic that's coming with depression, then I need to get myself to an AA meeting even though I'm relationally challenged by being there. I need to get over my reluctance to use the phone or get a sponsor or talk to people at a meeting. Uh, and so the, the, the change is behavioural but it could be difficult. And we can't afford to wait to feel better to make that change. That's the hard thing. Uh, and I suppose in early recovery what we try to do is start to get into the yoga, mindfulness, focus, uh, focused awareness or creating support systems of, of empathic people that, that can uh, help us even when we're in that state of unwellness. When I do the webinar on the model, I will be bringing in these symptoms of trauma in action. But essentially, if we've experienced developmental trauma, uh, the, the secondary symptom column there and the relational issues column is what we will experience in our adult life today. Uh, in regards to self-esteem, there'll be negative control issues that get, then get played out as relational esteem issues. We're either better than or less than that if we have really struggled and didn't grow up around healthy boundaries, then we will experience, as a result of poor boundaries in our adult life, resentment and rage, either external rage, overt rage to others, or that covert rage to self. We, we turn that shame inwards. And then essentially, relationally, we'll either experience relationships as a meshing, where we're locked in, uh, trying to be negatively controlling of each other, or abandoning, where we're in avoidance or meshing. Complex post-traumatic stress uh, experienced as that feeling bad and flawed, toxically shame-based, and trying desperately to be good and perfect, or in that over-inflated uh, 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 over grandiosity, if you did grow up in a family system that told you you were special and different, then you're in a spiritual crisis. Now, I'm not talking about a religious crisis, but living inside your own skin is difficult. And so being connected to the vital information from your body, having a good, clear centeredness around your thinking, uh, being able to be in touch with your emotions and make sort of moderate decisions is impossible. And so therefore, relationally, we're going to be dishonest with others. We will not be able to just share what's happening within because for, for a lot of us, we don't even really know what's happening within. I, I, I'm going to just tell you anything to get rid of you. And the great, the great dishonesty of of um, CPTSD and, 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 and codependency is I'm fine. It's, it's I'm just not going to tell you what's going on. I know in, in treatment uh, we had a discussion recently about, well, if, I'm, I'm, if you didn't ask me, I'm not lying, which is that immature primary symptom experience of self. Now, in dependency, we will start to see where the rubber hits the road. If we were, our needs weren't met, we were too dependent and, and now we're anti-dependent, we will see addiction issues, we will see a depression or anxiety, we will see physical illness. We can't outrun this pathology. It doesn't magically get better. That stress will play itself out somewhere. And therefore, relationally, we're going to have trouble with interdependence. We're either too dependent or any dependent. So coming together and working relationally can be incredibly difficult. We will simply have intimacy issues and there will simply be an intensity issues. So I just name those. In the next webinar, I really want to go into that. I met with Pia Melody last year. It was an amazing experience and she laid all this out in a sense of these secondary symptoms and relational issues. And so we talked about them now, symptoms of trauma in relation to our model. I don't want to d d define trauma at any great length tonight, but we're simply saying that if we experience physical, sexual, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual abuse or trauma, there's two extremes in that. It's overt or covert. So you can be physically abused by no physical nurturing or physical abuse, abused by being physically attacked, and that goes for all of the above. Um, or enmeshment or abandonment. Now, the, the irony there is if I'm enmeshed with a parent, if I'm drawn up to meet their needs, I'm being abandoned. It's a secondary abandonment, but if I'm just abandoned, I was abandoned. 
Now, the trauma uh, does change the chemistry of the brain. And as, as Alan Shaw in this quote, I'm just about to say, it's, it, this, this change in the way that the, the brain organises itself leaves us predisposed for addictions or compulsions because we don't regulate from within, so I'm going to reach without to pull something inside of me, either a chemical or a process, to affect regulate. The developmental trauma disorder that, that, that Bessel van der Kolk tried to put through for the DSM-5 didn't get accepted, but he was making the argument with a lot of other professionals that, that complex post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder it doesn't sum up exactly what, what uh, he was seeing as symptoms from clients, that, that, that it needed in and, in and of its own right a, 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 a diagnosis. It wasn't successful. But essentially, uh, what he was drawing from as well is that the biggest study that was ever done on, on adverse childhood experiences uh, was the ACE study. You can look this up online if you're interested. The only reason I put it up here is that um, it, it's much, the effects of trauma are much more widespread. It's not just people that turn up at a treatment centre for an addiction or a mental health issue. Our hospital ERs and uh, and, and uh, uh, Medical centres in general are full of people that are struggling uh, with the with the physical illness side of this disease. So up there it goes through the the the, uh, the intense affects of this in regards to how someone experiences themselves, uh, what they end up doing to ward off the recurrence of those emotions. So that's where we can see all those addictions. Uh, behavioural reenactments of the, tra the trauma, so people go on in what uh, John Bradshaw and Patrick Carnes would call trauma bind, so we're bound to the trauma, we'll continue to act it out or draw people to us in our life that will generationally pass it on to our own children, and then there can be multiple somatic problems, and, and so that, that graph there just gives you an indication of when people have had adverse childhood experiences, just what other symptoms we start to see. So it's much more this, this uh, looking at attachment, looking at the impact of it is much more complicated than we once thought. So, so this deceptively, it's, it's deceptively simple on the surface, um, and as Alan Shaw says, it, that real relationships of the earlier stages of life indelibly shape our survival functions in basic ways, and that for the rest of the lifespan, attachment processes lie at the centre of the human experience. So this, this, this was once a, a theory that is now through neuroscience and MRIs uh, from Alan Shaw's research and many others' research starting to, to, to give us some really concrete evidence now. How effective the attachment communications uh, were facilitate the maturation of the brain systems involved and, and simply the way we regulate our system. If we will, you know, what we know about parenting now, Dan Siegel's parenting book on, on, on uh, parenting from the inside out, that, you know, once upon a time babies were this precious thing that we sort of put in a crib and we looked through glass at and celebrated their birth. Now it's skin to skin immediately and parenting starts straight away, the cords cut, and unless there's a physical health issue for the baby or the mother, the, 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 it is skin to skin and we start that affect co-regulation immediately. And then that sets up the brain. Uh, through through that early development to, to, to once we're distressed, be soothed, distress soothed, then we learn how to self-regulate. When that doesn't happen, then we learn how to survive. Garba Mate is a, just, a, just a wonderful voice in the recovery community at the moment. Uh, his uh, Hungry Ghost book is a, is a bestseller. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, folks. Widely uh, available on YouTube for... His lectures are amazing, but he's been, and I'll leave this quote for you guys to read, but he's certainly talking now about the we need a paradigm shift to how we deal with addictions, how we deal with, uh, uh, Bradshaw 30 years ago was talking about uh, that it was second child scapegoats that were clogging up the the, the, uh, the jails, that, that, that treating people uh, that, that were developmentally traumatised now, separate them from the trauma and just deal with their adult experiences, uh, misses the point and, and rehabilitation will never happen until we bring those two together. He says here that I will read it because it's important. The hardcore drug addicts that I treat are without exception people who have had extraordinarily difficult lives. The commonality is childhood abuse. These people all end a life under extreme adverse circumstances. Not only did they not get what they need for healthy development, they actually got negative circumstances of neglect. 
that's what sets up the brain biology of addiction. In other words, the addiction is related both uh, psychologically in terms of emotional pain relief and neurobiological development to early adversity. So these scientists are coming forward and giving us a f fantastic information. Now Pete Walker comes along and he says that variances in childhood abuse and neglect, so depending on the abuse and neglect in our birth order or genetics, uh, will gravitate us towards a specific 4F survival, so the fight, flight, freeze and fawn. And we do this, we do this to prevent, escape or ameliorate further traumatisation. So in other words, we've got to survive, we can't leave. Bradshaw made that quote uh, on healing the shame that binds you that little Johnny can't walk into the lounge room and say, Mum, you're a crazy alcoholic, Dad, you're a crazy codependent, I'm going to go live with the Smiths. We have to prevent escape or ameliorate, to, to, to fall into the system to survive. And he says that, that, that what he notices is that, that, that fight types will end up with a narcissistic defence, flight types, obsessive compulsive defences, freeze types can we, where we develop disassociated type defences and fall types is that development of the codependency which we know well here at South Pacific. Now, all those things, like they have positive uh, characteristics that can go with them, uh, which you'll see in front of you. They're not all bad. And this is where that adult adapted child in Pia's work, uh, she talks very much that society likes people that can be in there better than, needless and wantless, good and perfect, really industrious, uh, 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 and, and, and um, in, their moder you know, in their moderation, uh, in control, so that so for a while there, those people can be running companies. We can turn up to a treatment in our Maserati. We can uh, not necessarily be at that real dishevelled. Now, some of us are dishevelled. We're in that scapegoat, uh, obsessive compulsive addiction, and we might end up somewhere different than that. So it can have positive attributes, which I'll leave you there to 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 be able to pause on when you get the YouTube video. What I wanted to talk about is the detrimental characteristics. This is another way of identifying, well, how would I know what sort of trauma that I experienced and what sort of defence mechanism do I have? Now, I think whenever you pull things from a book, I've pulled this from Pete Walker's book, like when I pull things from Pia's book, it never does it justice. But if anything on this uh, excites you, I'll, I'll, I'll do a plug here, I'll put it at the end, but this book of Pete Walker's, don't worry, it's coming up at the end, uh, it complements, it brings codependency and, and complex post-traumatic stress together in, in tools. So this, he says, you usually have a subtype as well. Uh, so, so, but, but it's looking for what would that look like. So, so um, this is where you'd see the detrimental characteristics of those different types. Now, the fawn one's interesting because it talks about the codependency of seguiousness, the servitude, the loss of self. In other words, look, I, I can't share what I think and feel because of what you think and feel, that John Lee quote we have on our wall here. Uh, People-pleasing, doormat, becoming a slave, uh, perfectionism, we end up becoming a victim, and, and a, parent, a parentified child. If you look at the other ones there, it's looking for what do you identify and relate with. Uh, and, and, and starting to see if there's any symptoms. If you'll notice in the flight one, uh, uh, when I was talking to Pete recently, he was saying that, that in his new book, uh, a chapter that he sees uh, is really important is, is, is busyaholic, that it's not just workaholism, it's, it's trying to outrun that chronic sense of abandonment that we feel implicitly. That, that, that abandonment for a child is death, I'm not going to survive, life's not going to work out for me, so I've got to stay busy. Uh, and to, to function. So for you flight types, you might relate to that. So, so looking through that, it gives us a sense of, of, of just how complex this, this is as it plays out in our adult life. It's hard to hide these detrimental consequences underneath the, the positive ones. Eventually, people start to see these and they become very difficult to manage. And, and, and as we know with the 12 steps of codependency, they become unmanageable. As we try and have power over these, our life becomes unmanageable and then we start to affect ourselves and, and everyone in our lives. So, so, so some of the ways to deal with this, and I always feel like this back end will be inadequate because there's so much to do, um, but, but it's, as Pia says, that first 18 months of recovery can be tough because 
for a lot of us, the defense mechanisms we had kept this stuff at arm's length. It kept everything away. It was fantastic to go into better than an invulnerability because you didn't feel anything. People could leave you and you didn't even feel the abandonment. You were shut down. But eventually as this stuff starts to come up and that vulnerability and that implicit memory bursts its way through, then all of a sudden we've, we're between a rock and a hard place and we've got to get into recovery generally. So we so so dealing uh, you know one of the the ways that we'll notice this is is through the reparenting model at South Pacific and we call it our adult adapted child and and so it's it's trying to shrink this 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 inner critic that is the core the adapted part of the toxic shame it can be caused from any uh, form of abuse or abandonment uh, or enmeshment. Uh, the most asked question here is, look, I wasn't sexually abused or I wasn't uh, physically abused. Surely my trauma can't be as bad as my, my uh, you know, colleague here that in recovery who, who has had that experience. What we know now, what the ACE study showed, that that emotional and intellectual abuse where a child's reality is completely uh, put down, uh, that ongoing humiliation was the phrase, uh, can lead to complex post-traumatic stress the same as physical abuse, the same as sexual abuse. So some of the common attacks that, that we know from the inner critic, so if you're thinking, well, God, have I got this inner critic? Some of us in, in recovery absolutely know what their inner critic uh, sounds like. Uh, John Bradshaw certainly made the point that, uh, that uh, once you know what your inner critic's like, if you want to shame me, stand back, let an expert have a go. I, usually our own internal dialogue is much more harmful than anything anyone else can say to us as an adult. But perfectionism, black and white thinking, self-hate, loathing or disgust, micromanaging, not just others but ourselves, so worry, obsession, we go around in loops, over-futurizing, so never being able to just let go and let God, always having to plan lists, unfair devaluing comparisons, so always putting us up against someone that we've got no chance to compare us with, uh, toxic levels of guilt, uh, shooting, uh, even when this was spell checked earlier, it was like, is that really, a, no, it's not a word, but if you're a codependent and uh, you've got an inner critic, you know what shooting is. You'll shoot ourselves and we'll shoot others. Busier holism, workaholism, overproductivity, not being able to go to neutral, harsh judgments of self and others, and in particular name calling. I had an awful experience with a friend, a fantastic musician, a lovely man, but he grew up with incredible sexual abuse in an overly religious home. And I saw him once make a mistake, and he really thought he didn't make a mistake. He blamed someone else for this mistake over, over a period of a weekend. And when he realised that that blame was his fault, I walked around the corner just at the time when he literally punched himself in the face. And it was just sad. He felt awful shame that I saw it, but, but nothing about my nervous system was... It was, 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 was shaming of him. I just felt the pain that that's what happens. To, it makes me emotional just thinking about it. The, it, it it's, that's the pain we're in uh, when, when, when you've got this sort of inner critic. So I, I know some of you out there that are listening to this now or listen to it after the fact know that pain. Um, the endangerment attacks that we can have. So this can, we can end up really uh, in very bad places with this. And this was another word, drasticizing. No, that's not a word, folks, but if you're a codependent or someone who has this, you know everything is drastic and we overemphasize it. Catastrophize, hypochondriasing is not a word either, but that, that idea that will turn anything into a disaster. The cup's always half empty, time urgency, never enough time, always struggling to get to where we're, what, what we need, we think we need to get done, a disabling performance anxiety, and, and that doesn't have to be a performance, that can be just getting the kids to school, uh, and, and pers perseverating about about being attacked. So we, it's, it's, it's perverse, it's all encompassing, and we're just continuing to worry that we won't be safe. So this, this critic being experienced as, uh, when we experience it, it's going to initiate flashbacks, especially emotional flashbacks. Thoughts will be triggers for that. Shame, we'll have shame internalised parents, so that those shame core messages now. So we, we will have shame binds within, we'll have perfectionism and emotional neglect, and we will use shame as blame un, unfairly turned on ourselves. So, so what we do with the reparenting part of our model is really important. Uh, I won't go through this at depth, 
but I just want to focus that the, what we do know is that the adult adapted child, the part of us that reflected how we were parented, its main goal is to attack, criticise, abandon and overindulge us. And we try and hide that wounded, more vulnerable part of ourselves and appear to the world better than we are. Now, to do that for any length of time, we're going to have those addictions, mental health issues and physical illness issues. So the idea of recovery, as Pia says, is that it's going to be turning it in and going to that affirming, nurturing and respectful limiting in regards to our self-esteem, boundaries, reality, dependency and moderation issues. Now, here's the kicker. If you've got complex post-traumatic stress, then the other thing we have to manage here is our state. And we've got to learn how to, to uh, start to get that integration, that neural integration that Dan Siegel talks about. I've put these slides in that are coming up and you can find this on Dan Siegel's website. We, we, we share this information in our Healthy Lifestyles lecture here at South Pacific. So it's a revisit for you guys that have been here. But I won't talk about it much, but what, what Dan said is once that, that the way of the brain, the left and right hemispheres have, have had that damage that Alan Shaw talks about, then in recovery through focused awareness we can start to develop uh, 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 an environment that our brain can repair. Now, now uh, in the mindfulness webinar I did recently, I, I, I cited some of the Harvard studies where they taught where they had uh, research from eight weeks of mindfulness grows the grey matter in the brain. They've got MRI images of this, and they show the electricity in the brain and the different activation points in the brain from pre and post. It's it's an amazingly exciting time to to. Uh, uh, to, to, to notice that we can change and create new pathways as well as alter active pathways. So, so this information that, that you'll see in this slide here, uh, I'm not certainly not going to read through that, but you'll get this slide when it comes out tomorrow in the YouTube video. You can pause it. For any of you guys that went through here, this is the information in our uh, Healthy Lifestyles lecture about how in your day you can weave in these seven different ways of, 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 of now growing your, your brain and, and learning to integrate in a way that brings you that real peace that, 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 that starts to deal with those complex post-traumatic stress symptoms. And the other thing on Dan's website and on YouTube is his wheel of awareness. He, he talks about the triangle of human experience, which I'll go through in a second, but this idea that focus awareness, the fact that our mind can choose what it focuses on, and this is that bit about making the unconscious conscious. If we're just lumbering through life thinking we're a victim to our thoughts and a victim to our history, then we're doomed. We become a prophet. But once we become aware that, that through practice, because it's not easy, anyone that's practiced mindfulness with a codependent brain, it's, uh, it's, it's tough work spending time with yourself, uh, but through practice, we start to be able to escort that 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 part of our uh, those symptoms, you know, back to uh, a state of wellness. Now, Pete Walker outlines in his book that somatically getting in touch with our body for some folks re-triggers trauma, but it's an opportunity to heal. It's an opportunity to access some of that feeling stuff and release it. So, so uh, some of the things I'm going to suggest in a moment are going to bring this stuff up, but we're going to deal with it in a different way. And this is just his, his triangle of human experience that, that the good news is, is that if we can change that focused awareness, it really literally affects the organ. So what, what we might have been predisposed to through trauma or genetics can actually start to be adjusted and, and we can live a different life in recovery. And this is, I think this is an enormous bit of information. But the thing that goes with it is, is, is that it's, it doesn't, happen overnight because we've got those existing pathways. So, so the, the thing is they, 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 there's that saying in recovery, don't give up five minutes before the miracle happens. I think we need a lot of support to maintain motivation at times when our symptoms get triggered. The Sooth Contain Move On uh, here at South Pacific was just our way of bringing in the work of Stephen Porges, Peter Levine, Pat Ogden, and, and, and it goes, the important thing here is that, it, that uh, polyvagal theory is the mechanical act of breathing, mindfully breathing starts to override that limbic central nervous system, that implicit memory, the way the viscera starts to react 
the, the mechanical act of breathing goes a long way to changing our physiological experience of self. Doctors know this, ER people know this, yogis know it. If you go, it, it we, we change our heart rate by how we focus on the breathing. Uh, Peter Levine has got many ways that you can brace the body, but the ones that we've got the, on that diagram there are just the butterfly hands, diaphragm, and the central part of our heart and lungs, just trying to connect. But it's also a lovely bracing for the body that when we are in that limbic reaction, we disconnect from self, especially with disassociating, so just trying to come into the body, feeling the warmth of the hands, bringing our attention to our breathing and just focusing is a way of getting us out of that panic. Now, the CBT bit comes in, once I get back into my body, my executive functioning starts to come down and I've got access again, then going through that reality and, and starting to process this at depth can be really helpful. Learning about our defence mechanisms, learning about our needs is really important. And, and then the idea of, of remembering to reparent radical acceptance, serenity, prayers, 12-step or other therapy group information that you can access at that point is now available because we've got that executive functioning back. If we don't get centred, if we don't get back into our body and lower the, the, you know, start to learn to regulate our affect, we can't access any of those tools, which is infuriating when you're in recovery. <clears throat> so the tips for dealing with the shame and dealing with the PTSD is, is, is uh, having some sort of aftercare recovery plan. Now, Patrick Cairns has a thing called a fire drill for sex addicts, and I actually think that it's a great tool for people with complex post-traumatic stress to have a plan of once I get activated in this, what might I be able to, uh, you know, what are my triggers, what do I feel in my body, and what are some of the courses of action that even when I'm stressed I can do. <clears throat> I worked with a lady that once had chronic uh, panic attacks. It was the result of developmental trauma. And I knew it was her on the phone. This was before we had call recognition that, that if, if the phone rang and no one was talking, it wasn't a prank call, it was her, and she was ringing from wherever she could get access to a phone. And I would just start that, that it was pre-butterfly hands, but just getting her to breathe, calmly into her belly, getting in touch with her body, and slowly but surely I'd hear her on the other end of the phone. And over time, she learned to ring when she was triggered. She'd start to ring when she knew she was going into that attack or she knew she was walking towards an environment or a situation or a family gathering where, where it might get triggered. So it's learning to identify that stuff in advance, take care of yourself, set good boundaries, Learning about our shame binds and starting to reduce that shame in therapy is really important. That mindfulness that I talked about from the Harvard uh, Institute, very important. Affirmations, as much as they, affirmations and statements of gratitude have an incredible effect because it's focusing our awareness on a positive. I was talking to a lady today that was doing EMDR and she, she, she mentioned that the, the, the part of the treatments that she really liked was, was, was focusing on something quite positive and feeling that, that effect in the body of the thing that was negative and starting to sort of have that shift around that was really important for her. And essentially in Pia's language is growing that functional adult. Now, I wanted to put these up there because what we're doing at South Pacific at the moment is referring people to, into our, our, uh, our uh, PTSD program, then uh, closed PTSD program, and then feeding people out into the community for, for these different sorts of therapies. So I just want to quickly explain them. The one on the top right is some uh, veterans uh, that are doing uh, improvisation, uh, acting, uh, getting getting into their body in a different way, and they're getting real responses to to uh, the symptoms, the positive responses to their experiences of PTSD from trauma. On here, you'll see that I've put the brain spotting logo for the Australia Pacific region. I've been I try, actually, I think I, I've got my brain spotting tool here somewhere uh, that I use. Um, Brain spotting is an extension of EMDR. It works. It's uh, you can look it up on the I I internet. There's uh, so, some uh, wonderful support coming from brain spotting now. It's where EMDR is is moving to. Uh, support coming from uh, Stephen Porges and Dan Siegel uh, getting excited. It's, and and Bessel, I think, sorry, not Dan Siegel, Bessel van der Kolk, uh, about this idea that we 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 work directly with the amygdala, which we know has is is uh, is that midbrain that 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 throws us into that that response, that overreaction. So we're starting to to learn 
where once upon a time we would we would uh, sometimes overly traumatize people to deal with that original trauma we're now learning ways to to go to the source of where the body holds the energy and that's where I put down trauma release exercises TRE neurofeedback radical exposure tapping by the Canadian uh, dash uh, Australian uh, uh, doctor dr. Laura McKinnon uh, that I mentioned the overcoming uh, trauma through yoga uh, I think that in, in recovery if you've got this complex post-traumatic stress it's giving yourself that opportunity and sometimes you've got to try a couple of different things to to see if it works for you some of these Therapies, if you're used to talk therapy, can be really a little bit odd in the beginning. To, to go and do improv therapy or to do uh, trauma-focused yoga, <coughs> the experience of EMDR where someone's you know moving or their fingers in front of your brain spotting where we find a place where there's an anomaly in the focus and, and just sit there resting in it and getting in touch with the way the somatic experience of the body. Uh, these All these things in, in and of their own right are really quite different than just talk therapy. So uh, ask questions, get informed, uh, speak to people that are doing it and, and try some of these things out as a way of moving forward and, and getting some real relief for these symptoms. I wanted to put some of these books up. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of P. Melody's Breaking Free. It was ahead of its time. Uh, it's the workbook that goes with facing codependence. Uh, like Alan Shaw's earlier literature, I've got his The Science and Art of Psychotherapy there, but but the 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 Breaking Free book was ahead of its time where it said that trauma is, is held certainly pre-7 in the body, in the feeling states, which of course the work of Ed Tronic, Alan Shaw, Peter Levine, Pat Ogden, Stephen Porges is now saying, well, that that's... Uh, you know, neurobiologically, that's correct. We can't outrun that pathology. That the, the, it's the, the, the bottom of the brain firing up. We lose that 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 ability to vaguely break. So, so breaking free. Pia was onto that many, many years ago. And, and so, these books can be good resources. And like, if you go to Amazon, they'll make other suggestions. Get curious. Get looking, and, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, all these bits of literature are, are, are generally. Uh, even though these guys are researchers and scientists, they're trying to deliver a powerful message to people in recovery that, that we can deal with trauma and lead to deal with trauma uh, differently than just the talk therapies. They can be complementary, but, but once we go into that, that sort of uh, body, sort of limbic reaction, then, then those talk therapies are offline for a little while. So, so I wanted to mention those. The recovery slogans and and uh, the complex PTSD can be interlinked. I think there's a lot of folks that found their way in 12-step fellowships before we know what we know today about uh, treatment. Uh, the 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 fact that it uh, I, I like to look at Dan Siegel's uh, integration uh, sort of neural integration methods and look at the 12-step fellowships and see how they overlap. The repetition of information, the, the, the attitude of gratitude, the slogans that are easily remembered by, by repeating and, uh, under stress, uh, the, the social connection that comes from being in a situation where you get that me too when you share, where people look at you and have empathy, which really is, is creating something relationally very different from the trauma that a lot of folks experience experienced in their family systems. So, so these things can be really powerful tools in recovery when, when we're trying to deal with some of our stress and trauma. Uh, the serenity prayer, I remember pinching this off the internet as soon as I saw it, I, I, I thought it's a, it's a wonderful way of, of how do we use the serenity prayer as a mindfulness tool. So that little diagram, uh, you know, once we get online, and this I, I, I've got to state that, that, that fact, that once we get sort of back uh, and we get our executive functioning back down and we, we got that executive functioning available, then we can work through this. For instance, for us SPP, it's that, it's that contain, uh, move on part of the, the, the butterfly hands. So we've got to get that affect regulation down with those other tools I mentioned, but this can be really helpful. Now, one thing, and putting this together, uh, I neglected to, uh, to put out was Pete Walker uh, in online has a wonderful uh, 
a toolbox at the back of his book that's available on his website, PeteWalker.com. Now, I'll make sure that we're, we're actually putting out a little caveat to this presentation that those symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress, there's an expansion. So we will put up a YouTube on YouTube within the week, just a little a little add-on to this. So look out for that. If you please subscribe to SPP's website page, but he had um, he, he's got 13 steps for managing the 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 flashback that can happen for for complex post-traumatic stress. So I'm going to read these to you. So you'll have access to this, but you can get the printout. I'll make sure that we get the printout of this made available. But it's the 13 steps of managing flashbacks. Number one is say to yourself, I'm having a flashback. That might sound ludicrous, but if we're in delusion and denial, we can absolutely just disassociate away. So, so just coming to terms with the fact that that, that this happens to me, that I have this illness. I know that people are against labels sometimes in recovery, that labels are just for soup cans, but to see your drama clearly is to be liberated from it. So to know that I have flashbacks, to inform loved ones that that can happen to me is important. And reminding yourself that I feel afraid, but I'm not in danger. Once, like with that Soothe Contain Move On, I work out I'm not in danger, I, I, I can start to soothe myself. So I feel afraid, I'm triggered, but I'm not in danger. Uh, own your right and lead to have boundaries. When Pia Melody first put out uh, the, the Facing Codependence in the preface, she says that the most important tool, if you're reading this, is to establish boundaries. Otherwise, you'll continue to be victimised or continue to be an offender. So, so only our right to having personal boundaries is really important. I speak reassuringly to the inner child. One of the wonderful gifts that people get out of our Changes program is they're introduced to that vulnerable part of them. They get an image for it. They get a felt sense of what that part of them's like. And so learning to, 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 to start to affirm that part of us that, that missed out on that, that level of affirmation when, when we were young can be an important part of this. Deconstructing eternity thinking. So those negative core beliefs about the rest of our life are so important to slowly but surely through therapy and journaling to deconstruct and not just to go into auto, unconscious autopilot around. Reminding ourselves that, that you're now in an adult body. Now, now what we know about the wounded child, as Pia says, it's a felt sense. It's age regressive. We feel smaller. So being mindful that I'm an adult person with resources right now is important. Uh, easing back into the body. Fear launches us into heady worrying and numbing and spacing out. So sometimes learning techniques through mindfulness, having a bath, getting massage, uh, to the, uh, some of the uh, uh, weighted blankets or toys, uh, uh, different textures, learning how to come back into our body gently is important. Um, unless th there'll be processes that we can do for that. Uh, resisting the inner child's critic for, for catastrophizing, so noticing that, 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 that part of the nurturing the inner child is also containing it and, 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 and making sure that we've got those boundaries we need. Allowing ourselves to grieve is a huge part. Pia talks about that with our model, that, that, that once we identify what we didn't get and, and start to get in touch with what we did get, that, that essentially it's a grief issue and, and the stages of grief, uh, as Virginia Satir points out, become very apparent in early developmental trauma recovery. And cultivating safe relationships and seeking support, a phrase I've liked for a long time in recovery is, I came from a, 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 a family of origin, I might have already created a family of, uh, of, of creation. Uh, as Pia says, sometimes you come to terms and you come to in recovery and you work out, wow, I work here and I live here and I'm married to you. It can be shocking as we try and work out that our life is a bit of a reaction to our trauma. But then we need to create a, a family of choice. Uh, where, and 12-step fellowships, whether it be CODA or Al-Anon or AA, can be a source of that, that family of choice. And other support groups of that nature can be helpful. Learning to identify the types of triggers that lead to flashbacks. It's essential for us to know what are those things on my fire drill that are likely to trigger me and what are some of the things I can put in place to support myself around those while I'm working on, as Laurie McKinnon says, desensitising those buttons that I need to have in place those fire drills, as Patrick Kahn says, to take care of myself. Figure out what you're flashing back to. Uh, one of the things Dan Siegel says about not generationally passing this trauma on is about getting our history straight. We've got the research now that tells us that if I have made sense of my own life story, 
it goes a long way to not re-traumatizing unconsciously the, the, the children in, in my life. So, so getting a sense of, well, when I do flashback, what am I reliving right now can, be, can, can really change that perspective on what's happening. And the other message that he says, and Peter says the same thing, is, is that it's a slow process. So patience generally isn't an asset that we have as, a, as codependent people because we've got that immaturity as our core. So, you know, one of the ways that 12-step uh, fellowships uh, support people with that is, is living just for today. And sometimes just for the next five minutes, I'm going to get through this. I hope tonight has, has been helpful uh, for, for people and please by all means give us some feedback. Uh, please email us if you can, uh, any questions or anything you might want to know more about. If there's any uh, quick questions out there now, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, just throw them through on the chat line and uh, I think I had 15 minutes to go about two hours ago, so, so but I'd be happy if I see a question come through, I'll answer it. Um, if any of the things I've mentioned tonight are something you're suffering with or continue to suffer with, uh, please, it's not uncommon for people to need to come back to treatment if you have been in treatment before. If you've never been to treatment and you've found your way to this webinar, please seek support. There's our contact details there, our email, our website. Uh, we have 24-7 uh, uh, access to someone that you can, you can speak to about our programs. They're confidential free assessments. Uh, and, and not just the inpatient program, but we have day patient programs now. So if you've gone to treatment somewhere else or, or, or elsewhere um, and you've come back to Sydney, Australia, uh, and some of our programs now are online, please contact us. We can do that back end support uh, so you can continue to get that benefit. As Khan says and Pia Melody says that, and as Pete Walker says in his book, it takes some time. It takes some time. And so, so we need that back-end support to change that story, learn how to affect regulate, learn how to feel again, and learn that functional adult. Um, uh, I know for myself I've, I've made it known, I, I just celebrated a, 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 a milestone in my own recovery of 30 years, and, and it was about a couple of years into recovery, relationally I started to see those symptoms. I'm a flight fawn type in the four Fs, and it wasn't until I got to, uh, to work with Pia Melody's model and then more recently starting to do my own work in regards to the radical exposure therapy, to brain spotting, uh, bringing yoga into my life. Uh, th these, these things uh, have changed the way even my recovery in, in the third decade is experienced. So I, I, if you're out there and you're still struggling, Please, you know, I think recovery is a lifestyle choice. It's not necessarily something that happens just to you. Um, I know that's a challenging concept. Some people want to move on and, and, and live really radically different lives. I think that's possible, but we, we can't outrun that pathology. So please get the support you need. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'll probably sign off now. The details are there. And as it says in our, our uh, foyer, when, we, when you come here, we, we say expect a miracle. And when people leave here, we hope they take that message with them that you are a miracle. So take care and good night.